Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Good Sugar Podcast. I'm missing my anchor, Ralph Sutton. I don't know. He's in Switzerland or Alaska or somewhere fancy. He likes to travel. So I'm going to try to do this on my own. I'm a little rusty at it. Today, I have a great guest. I have uh, Fred Bishi, who's my mentor um, with food. Uh, really helped me a lot in the last decade understand things um, from an interesting perspective, which is besides being a nutritionist and um, having great experience, he's 93. He's been doing a 100% raw vegan diet for uh, 50, 60 years now. So I don't know exactly the number, but he's pretty incredible what he's done. Um, he's done some big, big water fast, 40-day water fast, and I think that's pretty amazing. And um, he's a great person of the science of nutrition. We don't talk about abstract things. So let's not waste. Let's bring him up. Fred, it's great to have you back on the show last minute. I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, Ralph's out of town, and uh, we had something scheduled for Friday, but we had to cancel. And also, we get a lot of emails uh people requesting that we bring you back on the show. Do you uh, do you remember being on the show when we first started about a couple of years back when we were in the studio? I do a lot of podcasts. I'm on a whole bunch of different podcasts. Maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah, I remember. Um, first of all, how are you doing? You look great. I feel good. As I told you, I had surgery a couple of weeks ago. It's a little painful, but it's getting better. I had to do it. Um, I don't you know, choice. Specifically, I wanted to jump in to some questions that came in through the emails that uh, some of them were about different uh, episodes that we did. And I thought, who's better to uh, ask these questions than to Fred Bishi? I also wanted to acknowledge something on this show with you here. I think I acknowledged it the first time was that um, when I met you back in 2010, I was such a puppy when it came to understanding anything about health and wellness and nutrition. And I remember when we met outside of Juice Press, you came up to me and you said, uh, is this your spot? And I said, yeah. And he said, you're doing a good thing. And then I saw you about three or four more times before you actually started to talk to me. And then I think you uh, trusted that I was going to do the right thing over there. And you started to talk to me about everything that we were doing there. And it was such an amazing um, skip for me to not have to read 1100 books to talk to you and 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 use you as a starting point. And I said something on the show a few weeks ago, interestingly enough, that someone wrote in and said they really thought that that comment was well thought of by me. And I, I wasn't sure if I gave you full credit. I said in that show, we were talking about health and wellness, obviously. I said, the body's a miraculous healing machine with divine healing powers and something to the effect that uh, if you just get out of the way. And um, I almost quoted you directly. You know, I, I think it's in my head so much yeah, so no, the way that you fine. say yeah, and, I, and I And I didn't want to uh, sound like a plagiarist and make sure that I gave you 110% credit for that language. By the way, did you, that, where, did, where, did, where did you get your inspiration for that? Uh, who was your mentor, if you don't mind me asking? I asked you two questions, I'm sorry. Too many questions, but uh, I, I gave you a lot to start with. Well, you mean that the body is divinely inspired, the electrically carried, uh, electrically impulse and biological carried out. I made that up myself. Uh, but you mean that, who, yeah. who was my mentor as far as yeah. nutrition was concerned? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I went to school, uh, which, you know, a lot of the information I got, um, you know, in school was actually abstract science that. Um, I had a an incident in, in school when a, a professor said you couldn't go 15 days without food, drink, and water that you would die. I knew that wasn't true. I had already gone 35, 40 days past it. And that kind of changed my direction. I figured there was so much confusion out there. And today, more so than ever, there's more confusion out here now than ever. Because people have technology. They have their cell phone. You know, they're Googling all these different people that, uh, and there's all kinds of, um, you know, double blind studies and documentations to confirm, you know, polar opposite. So people are really, really confused. So, but I just kept, I just kept, uh, you know, do, 
doing research and I studied with some of the, oh, I believe to be the best uh, Europeans. I followed them, especially a Russian guy named Sergei Polanov, who actually taught me how to fast people are schizophrenic to get results. So it's just a, it's just a lifetime of pursuit of the truth and, you know, living the life myself and testing all the different narratives to find out what really was work, you know, what was abstract, what was but true. You're, but your your first generation um, with this type of lifestyle, you, you didn't you didn't come from vegetarian parents that were into fitness no, and, and, no. and food. So your first generation. So what was your inspiration? First of all, if you don't mind me, I, I used to, I remember back in the old days, we used to love to brag about how many years you've been walking on the planet. Um, for anyone who hasn't, uh, know anything about Fred Bishi? Fred, do you mind? Is it rude to ask how old you are? No, I was ninety-three, October eighth, a couple, you know, three, four weeks ago. That's amazing. That's uh, very young, and and uh, I know you very well. You're you're sharp as a tack, still, no matter what. Um, what inspired you to? What was your thing that inspired you to want to be thinking about this kind of stuff, uh, food and nutrition, the way that you do? Well. I, you know, a year that when I was uh, when I was growing up, you know, I was I was uh, dyslexic, and I think I brought this up. I had problems in school, <clears throat> and I got into sports when I was 16 years old. I was, you know, I, I did a lot of uh, boxing, and well, you know, I was an Olympic type weightlifter, and I got interested in nutrition to improve my performance, and uh, it kind of took me in a complete opposite direction because I realized what I was doing to build you know, muscle and strength was not the uh, the optimal type of a lifestyle for, uh, you know, health and longevity. What, you were you were a high-protein diet back in those days? I wasn't really on a high-protein diet, but I was, you know, I was. I thought that you had to eat, you know, what I learned in school, you had to eat uh, animal protein because it was the only complete protein. So uh, at that point in school, coming from the uh, from the establishment, you know, the, the people that were supposed to be the experts, I thought it was true, but it didn't take me long to find out it wasn't true, and that the opposite was true. There were certain aspects of animal protein was listed as three amino acids and uh, hem iron, and the being that the protein is what people think is complete, it's a factor in uh, um, you know promoting growth, which is also promoting growth of cancer. So uh, I knew it uh, didn't take me long to find out that. You know, I mean, you, you can, you have a choice. You can eat animal protein if you want, but we are not big cats. We don't look like lions or tigers or big cats. We don't have the anatomy or the physiology to sustain a long life on a diet that's high in animal protein. You can eat some if that's your choice. You know, you don't want to, not looking at the moral factors, but the plant protein is actually superior protein for the reasons I said. It doesn't, you know, stimulate the, the of growth production, which could be a factor in the different degenerative uh, inflammatory diseases, and cancer, and it definitely accelerates us. There is no society, no matter where you look in the world, whether you go to Africa, you go to Inuit Indians, no matter where you go, there's a lot of marvelous phys physical specimens that are hunter gatherers. They eat a lot of animal protein. Physically, they're marvelous physical specimens, but they really don't live a, a long, healthy life like the mass size. The mass size, everybody talks about the mass size. The average male lives 42 years, and the average woman lives 40, 40 years. Inuit Indians, they don't have a long life. Different, there's all kinds of different people that are forced into uh, certain dietary lifestyles based on, you know, the climate they live in, the, their economic circumstances. But science is now. You know, a lot of uh, scientists are making, uh, you know, what I believe is like a reversal of what they said, you know, 25, 30, 45 years ago. So, you know, like with fasting, you know, years ago, people thought it was fasting. We were starving. And we're still, we're still getting, uh, we're still getting smoked here, you know, the science that, you know, everybody talks about, well, I go by the science. Not really. Science keeps con conclusively changing. What they said was scientific 20 years ago now is unscientific. There's been changes. You know? So I think but, I, I should tell the audience just one quick thing, uh, which I probably should have mentioned in the beginning. 
um, I jumped right into the conversation. So you're a 100% raw food, plant-based vegan forever. That doesn't mean uh, very conscious eater for how many years now? It's more than a half percent. It's a long time. Um, and it's a difficult diet, you know, eat, not eating cooked food. It's not, it, it takes uh, veganism to the next level. And it's certainly that type of diet you would say by default is free from processed food. That's the big thing about your lifestyle paradigm is I think that what you did so well was you didn't put too much emphasis on what people should eat, although that's actually an important part of what you talk about. You put more emphasis on what people have to leave out of their diet in order for them to uh, be healthy. Is that, that's right. That's correct. Is that a good Well, I, I don't, I, I think the raw food diet, in my life has been a living experiment. You know, at this point in my life, now that I'm in my 90s, the most important part of my living experiment has been, is happening right now. See how long I can maintain a high quality, you know, high functional life. I'm not walking around with a walker or anything like that. I'm able to run and do everything else. So this is when it's really, uh, you know, this is when all the evidence um, get to come to fruition. But um, <clears throat> you don't have to eat a raw food diet to be healthy. You actually don't even have to eat a vegan diet to be healthy. But you are better off doing it. You're going to have, you're going you're to be much better off for the, for the very reason I. We're not designed to eat a high animal protein diet. That's very obvious. We don't look like cats or, you know, lions or tigers or even wolves or dogs. We're not carnivores, even though a lot of people go into a carnivore diet. Now a lot of people pushing a diet that's strictly animal protein. And they're showing scientific studies that they're getting results. And people are being misled by the scientific studies because they're not indicative of what's really happening. So, um, I mean, I think, um, you know, I have never seen anybody, I've worked with probably, I don't know, maybe thousand people over the years and all kinds of problems, you name it. And I've never seen anybody um, with serious acute disease to long, have long-term benefits. You have to wait. You have to start that over because your audio, I think, just completely dropped out. Go back from where you said you've been working with thirty thousand people. Well, no, in my my in my clinical experience, I've seen everything. I see wheelchairs. You know, had acute disease, different types of acute disease, you name it, autoimmune disease, but especially with uh, acute disease that could end up causing people in their lives and if some people that have done well. I've never seen anybody do well, unless they've done well because of, because of their medical treatment. So there are people that now the medical treatment is getting more and more um, sophisticated, there's no two ways about it. Doctors, medical doctors are prolonging people's lives with surgery and different types of medical treatment. If that's the way people want to live, I mean, I know people have both hips replaced, both shoulders replaced, knees replacement. Uh, you know, they have stints in their, their arteries. They didn't get that, they wouldn't be doing well. So I don't, I don't, uh, I believe in science. I uh, consider myself a scientist myself. Uh -huh. I, I want to say I want to what I want to. There's a few emails that came in, and uh, they were addressed to me, and they're definitely outside of the scope of what I'm aware of. And I and I wanted to uh, put push them onto you. I think uh, these are right up your alley. Can I ask you a few questions that came in by email? Yeah, you can ask me whatever you want. All right. So this one um, was from a person named Lauren in New York, where we're from. And she says, I watched the episode where you and Ralph spoke to the founder of the Mushroom Powder Company. Um, she was asking if we really believe in the efficacy of mushrooms and um, whether or not um, there was a mushroom that uh, I preferred or whether or not the mushrooms lose their efficacy when they're powderized. Do you know about that stuff? Medicinal mushrooms? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, medicinal mushrooms have their place in um, as a, an adjunct in helping people with different type of ailments. I mean, but again, all these supplements and everything that people are, are talking about that do have benefits to one degree or another, not, are not a substitute for understanding how to treat the human body and give it its best chance of eradicating the disease. 
So yeah, I'm very familiar with the medicinal mushroom. Chagra. Do you do you, do you use any? Do you have no. any kind of powders at home? No. How, how come you? How come you? Someone with your type of a diet would avoid that, or or you're not avoiding it. You just don't find the need for it. Absolutely not. It's just be just getting in the way with my lifestyle. Okay. It's not going to help me with my lifestyle. But but it would be more helpful to people. It's it's good. It's good. In, it's symptomatic treatment. It's a beneficial symptomatic treatment, like nutraceuticals and vitamins and minerals, depending upon, you know, what the quality is. But once you understand the best way to do is don't treat the symptoms, don't treat the symptoms of your problem to try to eradicate the cause, then you don't yeah, get to the root cause, right? Just the same no, thing in so psychology. It's very easy with, with fasting or, or um, you know, juice cleansing and things like that. When you, whenever you leave out, the man, one of the biggest problems we have in our society today, and it's getting worse, is that the processed food is a disaster. And a lot of so-called scientists are, are trying to label, like, well, let's take sugar, for instance, right? You take the high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is proven in many, many different studies, you know, they're, uh, that it's very detrimental to the human health. But there are people, scientists, that are saying that the fructose in, a, in an apple, is the same thing as the fructose in high fructose corn syrup when it's been separated from the matrix of the all the nutrients in an apple. It's totally ridiculous. You know what I mean? That's just, well, it's conven It's what do they call it? The convenient truth. If you do a double blind study and you're being paid by a company that, that needs a specific result, you can find the result anytime you want. And I don't think that the public oftentimes isn't smart enough to be able to say, well, who studied the study? to see that the study actually wasn't biased or that, you know, the, the, it, it is utterly ridiculous today that people would think that fruit is not compatible to human chemistry, that for some reason that eating fruit in your diet is going to lead to diabetes. That, that's well, a common not, thought. They're not so much worried about diabetes. They're worried about the effect it has on cancer. There is, Can if you no. take, if you eat an app, <laughs> If you're following the standard American diet, you're eating all kinds of, um, you know, processed food, empty calories, and everything like that, and you have diabetes, and you start eating, you eat a couple apples, your blood sugar is going to go up because you're adding to the caloric pool. So, but if you're, you're, eating, you're adding to the calories of the overall diet, which becomes the problem more so than the sugar in the apple, right? And you're going to spill sugar. So if you, and if you're eating a clean diet. And you're eating, say you're eating a vegan diet that's like 70% raw and 30% cooked, duh. your blood sugar's going down. It's not going to go up because you're actually utilizing, you know, the, the calories. Or, and the calories are different based on the food it's coming from and how efficient your chemistry is. So uh, this, in my estimation, to make it simple, there isn't anything wrong with eating fruit. Uh, I'd be dead. That would be dead a long time ago. I don't, right, I don't. Here's a here's a question from Florida, Linda. I'm just going to summarize the question. Uh, it's, it's one of the questions that I think you and I both have heard a lot in our different occupations. Uh, Linda says, "Until recently, I was vegan for four years. I started to feel weak for about nine months, and so I went to an Ayurvedic doctor who told me that my blood type required me to eat meat. I started eating eggs, chicken, and fish, etc. I feel better. What do you think of that?" <laughs> well, I, I think uh, the blood type diet was originated by Dr. Joe Diodamo. That does happen to a lot of people. But um, when you go to a, a vegan, did she say she went to a vegan diet or a raw no, diet? No, she was on a vegan diet, and then she came off and went back to eating animal protein and felt better. Well, yeah. What happens a lot of times people go into a vegan diet, especially with a raw diet, they, they expect to feel better. They might feel better for the first couple of months. Then your body goes into this biological change, which could take a very long time. But the best thing to do is to, is to get a blood test and take a look at vitamin B12. Some people run into a B12 deficiency. You can run into a B12 deficiency. I really don't like to comment on cases like that because everybody's a unique individual. But most of the time when I hear about, the, you know, I know loads of people that are type O, you know, type they have, they should be carnivores that have been uh, vegans for uh, you know, 25, 30 years. <clears throat> I'm not dogmatic. I don't. I don't get locked into. It. Somebody comes to me. They want to eat some animal protein. They're making that choice morally, and I, I can put them on a healthy diet and eat a moderate amount of animal protein. I can do that. 
but that case, I don't know that much about that person. If I knew her and I could question her, and I knew what she was doing, I mean, a lot of people follow vegan diets. They're a disaster. A lot of vegan diets are not healthy. Yeah, they're eating processed food. I think what it, what it brings up for me in that question, as a guy with a juice bar who practices a certain lifestyle, is I think a lot about my own process of tra- changing. You, when, you, when you let go of animal protein and you've been eating it your entire life, the, at some point you're going to crave the fullness, the taste, the texture, even the stimulation that animal protein gives you. Also, we have I have associations with animal protein with happy experiences of my life on the holidays, Thanksgiving, Passover, whatever holidays, everybody was sitting around the table, the family's there. So the food gets programmed into the psychology. And I definitely think that there is a detox period. And oftentimes people do feel worse or weak, or for some reason they feel flat or whatever. And they just don't have someone there to help them to understand exactly what they should do next, which is to continue on the path, cleaning up the diet even more to get through that. Because um, I'm not saying like, I agree with you. I don't care. I don't judge people for eating. If they want to eat snails and and, and, and cats, it's not my, my business. I just think that um, it is important to have some someone to mentor you through the difficult stages of diet that we go through when we're cleaning up. They need people like that. They need guidance. You know? And anybody that's a, um, a good practitioner is not going to lock everybody in. I'm not, I don't get on all these podcasts. I don't get on it just to um, you know, push a vegan diet, which I do believe. You know, I see, I think no, you don't. Are, no, I, I've heard I'm you, not that type of vegan. I've heard but, you 10,000 times. In fact, I would yeah, say I would, you're probably one of the better marketing people on how you talk about diet. You're very inclusive. Um, you know when to punch with the right, meaning I know how you talk when you're helping someone. You'll make them feel comfortable by not being dogmatic and saying, you have to do this, you have yeah, to that's do that. Ridiculous. Well, it shuts people down. They stop well, it's learning. It's not personal with me. It's not personal. Right. I'm not, I don't have people who come to see me to make me feel good. People come to me, I, I'm supposed to make them feel good. Right. Plus, I want to go back to something you said before, which a lot of people don't seem to be aware of. There's a ma- Addiction is a very, very big part of what's going on in the world today. Not only people are addicted to drugs, alcohol, sex, running, whatever it is that, of course, the basic addiction in life is feeling good. But food, processed food, is a major addiction. And it works. There's a psychological component to food. So if you're used to eating processed food, a lot of people just can't break that addiction unless they know what's going on because, because all deep. addictions work through the hunger drive. And it works through the hypothalamus brain at the core of your brain. No matter what it is, it works through the hunger drive. No matter what, what it is, because that's the way your brain is designed. So when you're addicted to, when you start to eat a clean diet, even though you're seeing results, changes in your whatever going on, whatever process you're trying to help yourself with, there are people that go back to eating some of the, the foods that not only will make them sick, when they go back, they make them feel uncomfortable. They don't feel good. So they go back to doing the good things. And when they feel good for a couple of months, six months, that, that same psychology starts to take place and they go back to it again. Right. That's why I use hypnosis with some people, which works very well. But, you know, you're dealing yeah, with so not many every, variables. Not everybody's open to uh, direct hypnosis without all the bells and whistles and of, you know, other mind tricks. I think most people have to really understand this eating is really deeply linked to our emotions, no matter what, right? The body and the mind I are think connected. Most, I think most people understand that. I think a lot of people. Uh, okay, let me rephrase that, uh, Your Honor. Let me say it like this. I was aware of this stuff because I got sober at 15 and was in therapy, and it still took me more than 30 years to really absorb what the what the obvious information was, which is cause and effect. Things happened to me throughout my life that affected me, and they caused me to think a certain way or behave a certain way. And I talk about processed food. Again, you as my mentor and and me being, you know, um, in a different business than you, the way I look at 
processed food is I just look at it as first of all, it's just everywhere. It's just everywhere you turn. Oh, there is processed food. It's it's marketed towards us. There's signs everywhere. There's commercials everywhere. We go into supermarkets. There's just you know fifty rows and thousands and thousands of products trying to jump off the shelf. And, um, and it tastes good, Mark. If it tastes, it tastes good. good, it tastes good. Uh, it changes our chemistry, which changes our emotions. We're, we're hungry. We got to eat. Uh, how much time do we really want to spend thinking about our diet? There's so many other problems in the world. And um, what's the big thing? There's there's a lot of belief systems in there, you know, that that have to be unraveled for a person to become aware that corporations are allowed to profit from poisoning the citizens of its country slowly. Like if they were just dropping cyanide in a box and people died right when they took a bite, they would illegalize that. But for some reason, <laughs> if it's happening over 30 years, we let it pass. And likely, it's because the people who are writing the laws that protect us, they're also addicted to processed food. They don't know any better. Yeah. And the second thing is it's corrupt. They don't know any right? better. But it's also corrupt. And you laugh because to you it's funny. And, and I know it's funny to you in a tragic way because you've seen yeah, a lot more absolutely. people suffer than me. But you're laughing because it's ridiculous. It is literally ridiculous that there are man-made products on this earth that are disguised as things that are supposed to help us, but they inhibit our emotional realm. They block us from feeling comfortable in our body they make us sick and unwell and they keep us locked into a loop because what comes next is you graduate from processed food to pharmaceutical drugs to help us cope with the result of these lifestyle patterns and it's it's just so monotonous and absurd that only crazy people like us understand that what why like we just this like a screw loose in me and you that we actually get this um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it's a, it's the thing is, we have to, we have to be, um, we have to understand. If you go, you, if if you go through all the trial and error and part of the learning process that I went through and you went through also, but and all the, the people that tried to ostracize you, like yes, 50 years ago when you spoke about, you know, a short fast healing somebody or even eating a raw food diet, you were immediately people just thought you were. Uh, you know, some kind of fanatic or extremist. Now it's starting to come mainstream. There's all kinds of wonderful information on YouTube about fasting and by by uh, you know cardiologists and different scientists and um, you know there's so much information now and videos are made about veganism that it's you know it's possible to be a vegan and to be a healthy person and get all the nutrients that you need. Uh, maybe not B12 and you can get some B12 too. You know know how to do it. But uh, <clears throat> I don't. I think it's very, very important that we <clears throat> that if you understand what's taking place, and so many people are losing ground rather than getting ground, that we have to be, we have to have humility, and not to step up and say, "And I told you this 45, 50, 55 years ago," because there are a lot of people struggling, and they're just barely coming out of, uh, you know, coming out of the darkness. Of the ignorance that we've been indoctrinated into, we've been indoctrinated into a healthcare system. It was more about money. It was more about the benefits of the provider than the recipient. There's people out there, and there's a lot of economic factors. You take, for instance, that a lot of poor people and some people of, of color, you know what I mean, that were, were cut, born into an economic system, they didn't have the money to buy good food, so they were indoctrinated all this junk food, you know, different. Hot dog joints on the corner and, you know, whatever you want to call them. And they were eating that, that type of food. And that's why, you know, they got coronary artery disease, heart disease, uh, you know, younger and younger. And so we need now, I see a lot of young people coming up that are on a mission. And guys like you, you know, that are on a mission, not just business wise, but you're on a mission as you become, your knowledge becomes more profound. You're out there trying to help people to kind of guide people to come along with you. And maybe you'll be mentoring other people. And well, it's, how, it's how it's how we say it, because I don't think anything that I know is 
so revolutionary or evolutionary it's it's to me it's simple when when it's explained to me and i understand it for myself it's rather mm -hmm. simple now it's a question of how far advanced i can get in my own practice what i'm willing to surrender and what i'm willing to let go of at any point in my life and i keep working on it and i think my approach to helping people finally at age almost 54 is to concentrate on opening up a healthy restaurant and adhering to the principles that I think I've been living by and certainly principles that you helped me shape in the restaurant business, although they became corrupt and perverted towards the, the end as I was leaving, which happens in companies that have to make payroll. And I fought tooth and nail uh, to um, keep things a certain way. And quite honestly, it, I could say, honestly, it doesn't work as a business model. I say it all the time. I don't think you can take ultra pure food that has, that checks every single box, like, you know, and, yeah, and make know. that into a big chain. It's just not feasible. And it's not really meant to be that way. I think when, when we talk about processed food, if someone said, well, where do you think all this processed food started? I'd say, well, it didn't happen because we had supermarkets and refrigerators. I think it happened hundreds of years ago when we industrialized farming and agriculture and people just became completely divorced from food. They never even saw food grow. They just sat somewhere where, and they were waiting for the delivery of bags of grain or whatever they ate. Yeah. And that was the that was the the beginning. What do you think about the beginning of that of process? Oh, I, I, I think you're hundred percent right. It makes me think back when I was growing up in the thirties, you know, at the end of the depression, and I came from a family of nine nine children, and there was just a, a little store down the street. And when you went into that store, they everything there were vegetables that were still had dirt on them, bunches of beets, everything was fresh. There wasn't that much refrigerated. What was what was the first junk what was the first junk food there? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Did they have Marcus, potato chips? I, we were so you know we had we were so poor that when I had a few cents, I was telling my wife Alma the other day. I never went to the candy store and bought candy. I used to either go out and buy a can of sardines because I love to eat sardines, <laughs> or buy some potatoes. And we had a they, we used to go out into the woods here in Staten Island and start make a pit fire. We used to roast the uh, potatoes, eat the sardines. And, you know, of course, we, I love good food. And my mother was an, an excellent, excellent uh, cook. She was all freshly prepared food. She went out into the woods and gathered up mushrooms and different types of greens. And everything. So I was very lucky. Do you, but, do, you, you know, miss, do you ever miss sardines? Do you ever burp sometimes and you taste the sardine in the back? I, the I thought about it. No, I don't. I would never do it, though, because I know what would happen to me after all these years. I, I can't. I, I couldn't be the end if I wanted to. I could eat steamed vegetables if I want to, but I don't want to because I know it would open up a whole Pandora's box of cravings, you know. I'm very happy with what I'm doing. I'm tickled pink. I really am. You know, me, I was saying the other day that, you know, he said, you kind of eat like a gorilla. Yeah, that's true. I take a melon. I eat a whole melon in the morning, you know, and then I make a nice salad. Or what is that? It's food. nothing. It's a couple of hundred calories, all right? Yeah, you don't need it. Yeah, but you become more caloric efficient. That's the key to longevity, yeah. being caloric efficient. Burning, le burning less, having more energy left for your Less calories system. because of biological efficiency. I, it took me a while to, to understand that, and I did. I, I, the metaphor I used to use was I'd think about a suspension bridge and how much of the strength of the geometry and the architecture and the materials go into just supporting itself. For sure. Forget yeah, about exactly. what's driving over it. And right. most of us, we our diets were so impure that so much energy goes into processing the garbage that we're eating, and there's not a lot left over for carrying out your activities and also for your immune system to keep in reserves. Exactly. Holy exactly. smokes! Well, I, I, I listen. It's always great to have you on the show, and I hope that uh, we can have you back as many times as possible. I really appreciate you coming last minute. I talk about you all the time. And uh, I just think you're a, you're a great human being. You're a great role model to me. Thank you. I, I try. Thanks. Thanks for having <laughs> me. I appreciate it. You have anything you're promoting right now that you think is important? No, not really. Do? Not really. I, I'm in the process of writing another book. I hope, um, you know, to kind of address 
uh, the, the confusion out there because a lot of people are starting to follow a carnivore diet and different types of diet and they're wondering why uh, medical doctors are saying it works. You know, it's working for a very simple reason. It's not the animal protein is doing. They're leaving out cake candy, so leaving out all these other things. If you get drinking clean water, I mean, if you're breathing clean air, drinking clean water, you get enough sleep every night, and you're getting sufficient calories, even if you ate horse manure, you can last four, five, six years until you run out one to different kinds of problems. How, how so, important is it that positive attitude is included in your list? Oh, extremely important. Stress is a killer. Stress is a killer. You can be eating the best diet in the world. If you're under a lot of stress. You have severe anxiety. You know, you people are driving you crazy. You can still get. Are you? Would you say that your philosophy, you're a stoic, that you're into stoicism? No, I'm a very open-minded guy. I realize that <clears throat> as that when you leave everything out and you, you try to live a spiritual life, and you you're adhering to all the laws of nature to govern the human body, your mind you're always developing. Open consciousness. I believe my consciousness is still open enough. You start to become more intuitive about things that are happening in your own life. You know, you become a better judge of things. And I mean, cognitively speaking, you just you don't deteriorate. So far, not, I haven't seen any deterioration. Zero. I, thank you, Fred. You're okay. The best. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. All the best. All right. Bye bye.